So welcome, Mr. Donald. I hope you're on, on the phone with us. Yes, I am. Um, uh, can you guys see me at all? Because I'm also on, uh, on Zoom, so I don't know if you can see me or not, but yes. Yes, we, we can I, see you I perfectly. I can see you, so I can see you. Yeah. And I, I, I very much apologize to keep you waiting, but we had a great conversation about talent. And so, well, so yeah, my apologies for keeping you waiting. No problem. No problem. So we just watched a video of, of your background and everything. And so I wanted to ask a couple questions. Um, the first being is that, um, you know, the cruise and the hospitality industry obviously have been affected. With the cruise industry, they've been more severely affected than probably any other industry in COVID. And how is your company doing now as we begin to hopefully come out of COVID? And where do you see the future? Wow, that's, that's a lot. So first of all, hello, everyone. Wish I was there in person instead of virtually. So, um, um, but um, scheduling didn't allow that. But in any event, look, uh, it's true. Uh, the cruise industry and our company in particular were uh, devastated by the pandemic. You know, we had to pause operations. We voluntarily paused, but we paused operations, um, which ended up being a pause for, you know, well over a year. Uh, but not only that, I have 150,000 employees in total, about 90,000 were on ships at the time that I had to get home. And there was no way to get them home. You know, airlines weren't flying and borders were shut down. So we had to keep them safe and, and get them all home. We had a quarter of a million guests. We were able to get home in a week or so. But the crew took a lot longer. It took us months to do that. Then we had to ready the company to stay, you know, the course. And we didn't know for how long. And so we had a burn rate of about $600 million a month with no revenue, with zero revenue. Uh, so we had to raise, you know, some capital. Um, we did a number of transactions and, you know, secured um, close to $24 billion in um, additional runway for ourselves through about 14 different transactions. Um, and since that time, um, we started sailing in Europe. Um, even before vaccines, we, you know, once the epidemiology of um, COVID was understood and the transmission characteristics were understood, we were able to restart in countries where regulations allowed. Uh, it wasn't the most exciting cruises. It was, you know, cruises around the coast of Italy for Italians or around uh, uh, the UK for British citizens, that kind of thing. Uh, but we were able to start uh, with uh, to, to get some of the ships active. And now uh, we're going, doing reasonably well, where by the end of the year we'll be, as we said in our last business update, um, we'll be you know 50% or so of the fleet sailing. Uh, we have a number of ships now sailing close to full occupancy uh, under you know strict protocols, always in the best interest of public health. And so you know we're, we're off to a good recovery but we have a ways to go. Uh, but we are now, you know, seeing ourselves bringing in some revenue. Um, the bookings are very robust. There's plenty of demand. Uh, but we have to navigate, you know, the ever-changing um, regulatory environment and protocols as is recently occurring with the latest variant out of um, out of Africa. Thank you for that. And I don't know, not, not many people probably know this, but you're also the chairman of the World Travel and Tourism Council or the WTC, yes. which is really the most important global travel association in the world next to the association where you're speaking. And, <laughs> and it represents really all aspects of travel from airlines to hotels to cruise lines. And I believe obviously that you, your regular job keeps you very, very busy. Why did you take on this job in addition to what you're normally doing? And what is the importance of, this, of your role for this organization? You know, WTTC, as you point out, is uh, a little over 200 member companies, but um, very engaged with the ministers of tourism around the world. Uh, the ministers, um, um, uh, you know, uh, come to, to our summits, et cetera. But most importantly, uh, what we do is we try to facilitate making travel frictionless so the entire travel industry can prosper. So in this particular time, there's no more important time for WTTC than now. You know, when we have four basic principles, 
you know, we're promoting. One is vaccinations, that um, there's uh, acceptance of approved vaccinations approved by WHO and others so that nations don't cherry pick which vaccinations they're going to approve, that there's vaccination equity, uh, that, you know, the efforts are made to get the vaccines, you know, to all aspects of society globally. Um, secondly, that, you know, there are strong protocols in place, um, you know, testing, vaccine protocols, et cetera, to ensure the best interest of public health, but that those are, you know, harmonized. And that in the end, you want to evaluate the individual. So you don't label a country. Either a person has been vaccinated and tested properly or they haven't. Um, uh, they, you know, and so whatever the science says, the medical expert says, um, if, if, if the person has done these things, that person you know, uh, is a low risk of, of spreading any, uh, any of the virus, uh, that people be treated as individuals. Uh, as opposed to labeling nations and saying this this nation's red, this one's yellow, uh, because in the end it's the individual that's going to um, uh, you know uh, carry uh, the virus or uh, be protected from it. And then lastly, that we make it as frictionless as possible. So any kind of digital pass, anything that that eases it for the traveler. And and those are some of the core principles, and we promote that actively with governments around the world. Um, uh, Julia Simpson is our uh, current um, executive director, uh, and she's doing a fabulous job. She followed Gloria Guevara, who was formerly Minister of Tourism for Mexico before becoming head of WTTC. And so our relationships with governments around the world are outstanding. And, and we've had some impact and, and continue to work to do that so that all of travel can prosper while serving the best interests of public health. So the question we all want to know, and, and I'm not sure you can answer it, but if you can, it would be great. You know, as chair of the WTTC, what are the projections for when travel may return to some normalcy? <laughs> so travel <laughs> has returned to some normalcy in some places for some period of time. But for the whole world to be back to whatever normal is, if there is ever such a thing, um, clearly what it's going to take is uh, the point where the virus uh, becomes uh, accepted an accepted risk and, and the risk having been mitigated. So if you think about it, you know, 22, 24 months ago, we didn't understand what it was. Nobody understood the epidemiology, how it was transmitted. Even the um, impact of it wasn't well understood. 22, 24 months later now, we have multiple vaccines advanced therapies, um, very effective protocols to, to mitigate spread. Uh, in our industry alone, we have nine Whirling and Cruise Line brands. Eight of them are sailing now. And we've sailed well over, in the last few months, well over half a million people with very low incidence of any COVID on board and no incidence of any significant spread, you know, on board or once people um, uh, left the ship. So, you know, well understood protocols with vaccines and advanced therapies to mitigate the risk of hospitalization or worse. And, and that's what it's gonna take when people feel that they can move about freely and not have a great risk of contracting the virus and being hospitalized or worse or having some long-term effect, uh, then we'll be able to um, you know, move about in a way where uh, people will call it more normal. And that's coming. We've made tremendous progress in the last several months um, despite this variant, there was a variant before the Delta variant. Now there's this variant, but this variant isn't, not, isn't even understood yet. Um, it, you know, so far, you know, anecdotally, it looks like the symptoms are very mild, even though if it is highly infectious. Um, but we can't conclude that yet. We got to let the science do its thing. Um, but what we do know are the protocols they have in place and the fact that if you're vaccinated, you're mitigating the risk of um, having a severe reaction. And I want to congratulate you and, and all your company has done to really rest, restore um, really confidence in travel. Because if you think about it, you, tech, you know, if you think about a cruise ship, you think, oh, my God, that's the spreader event that's going to happen. And the fact that people aren't getting sick and you're doing all that, I think it says, well, I can go stay in a hotel. If people can stay in a cruise line, I should be pretty good. So thank you for all the protocols yeah. you put in place. Hey, thank you very much. But you, what you have to understand about the cruise industry is 
this isn't our first rodeo. And we, we my company alone goes to over 700 ports every year, over 13 million people. We have medical centers on the ships. We've had to deal with viruses and diseases, you know, throughout time. So we've dealt with Ebola, SARS, MERS, Zika. So these are things we have to be able to deal with. And initially on this one, we just had to understand it, just like you have to understand the others. But once we understand it, we can manage through it because we, we have controlled environments. We have medical centers on board. We already have enhanced sanitation practices. We already have enhanced medical screening practices because we go around the world and there's always something somewhere in the world you've got to you know, pay attention to. So, um, so we have a long history of successfully dealing with that. And it is critical for our business. You know, a lot of people um, suggest regulatory and we, we have to deal with so many different regulatory bodies around the world. But the reality is, think about it. Nobody wants to get on a ship if they know people are getting sick or whatever. So we can't let that happen on our ships. And the same for environmental. So I'll, I'll end with this and then you can ask me any other questions you like. Our highest responsibility and our top priority always, always is compliance, environmental protection, and the health, safety, and well-being of everyone. Mm -hmm. That's our guests. It's the people in the communities we touch and serve. And of course, it's our Carnival family. That's our shoreside and um, shipboard personnel across our nine World Union Cruise Line brands. And, and, and that is the foundation that we then get to deliver joyful vacations, which allows us hopefully over time to deliver outside shareholder returns. Um, but but the, the foundation has to be compliance um, because you have to have freedom to operate, environmental protection, the health, safety, and well-being of everyone. And so we are geared, engineered, and focused on that. And it is, it is fundamental to our business because without doing those things, we have no business. And, and I've been lucky, fortunate enough to take many of your, your cruises. And I find hey, that everything you. you said is right well, spot on. Yeah. Thank uh, you. This is a, obviously a gathering of, of luxury hoteliers, and, yes. and, and you have at least one brand in the luxury space, Seaborn, which I see is expanding into the adventure oh, travel ultra space. Seaborn is ultra luxury. We have some luxury. You know, Cunard is, yes. a, you know, Queen Mary too is iconic, and then we have um, uh, some high end also in some of the other brands in Holland American Princess. But Seaborn is our ultra luxury. You're correct. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so can you? Tell us about, so, you know, we're in here with hospitality hoteliers. What are you doing in the luxury space and this adventure travel space that, that is transferable to the hospitality industry in terms of the hotels and, and the people in the room? Can you give us some, some things you're doing that you feel is really kind of leading edge that we can learn from? Yeah, I, I, I'll share what we're doing, and you guys can determine whether it's leading edge and, and whether there's anything to learn from it. But, but the core essence uh, for any travel, but especially ultra luxury travel, is that you feel as customized and tailored for you and as frictionless, that you know everything is easy. So on Seaborn, the crew, they know your name. They know who you are. They know your preferences, okay? Now, we've engaged in some technology. I, uh, recruited when I first came into the business, I said, what's the essence of this business, so on and so forth. And, um, and I sought someone to work around the, the essence of this business. And the essence of this business, where hospitality business is to exceed our guest expectations. So who is the most innovative person in innovating in guest experience? And I searched the world and, and I found a guy, he happened to be at Disney at the time. He had done the, um, the bands at Disney and Fast Pass and all that. Uh, his name is John Padgett. So I brought in John. We built an innovation center. A few years later, I gave the keynote at the Consumer Electronics Show uh, for the technology that we've introduced. So you take Seaborn, which is ultra luxury, and you can do it because you have your know, high crew to guest um, relationship. And we, it's a small number of guests. The ships have as little as 200 on the expedition ships that are coming, um, typically 400 or so guests, up to 600. But we have ships with 6,600 guests. And we want to deliver that frictionless experience and a highly customized experience at scale as well. And so this technology uh, is called Princess Medallion. And the platform is called Ocean. Um, the delivery vehicle is a little disc, uh, which identifies you. We encrypted it anyway, but it's basically like a license plate. 
And then there are sensors throughout the ship and, and there's um, portals throughout the ship that uh, in your room and elsewhere you can look. But basically, because of it, our crew know who you are. So every crew member from the cabin steward to the captain can call you by name. You walk in a bar, uh, they know what drink you had and they can have it ready for you. Yeah, uh, or they can ask, would you like something different? Uh, you're in Alaska, you see a whale off the bow of the ship. Everybody runs out to see the whale, the drink will come to you because we know exactly where you are um, at all times. Similarly for planning uh, your journeys, your excursions, um, in any planning, dining, you walk in the retail shop, you take what you want, you walk out, it's automatically registered. So, so those are the, that's the type of technology <clears throat> capability we're deploying. Um, we can take that to another level. Um, we are in the metaverse and we, we actually literally from anywhere can see people live on the ship and um, they have little DNA strips um, and we have, you know, gamers who can um, uh, look at that and say, hey, the Lido deck is filled with people, about 60, 70 percent of people prefer country music, switch the music to country music. OK, uh, so that's the capability and it's all engineered around the guests to make life easy for the guests. You're on the ship. You know, we had to come up with the Z axis. You know, if you do your um, uh, if you take the map or whatever you're doing um, uh, to find a destination, that's all on X, Y. The ship has Z. We have, you know, decks. And so we had to figure out how to do that. But we did. We have patents on it and everything. And so now. If you're on the ship, you can find anybody in your party real time walking along the ship to stop at a portal. Uh, you know where everybody is on the ship. We have some older guests and some younger guests who uh, may have memory challenges and other things. Everybody's comfortable. They know where they are. They can get to them easily. Uh, it just takes ease. You don't need a key, a room key. You walk up to your cabin. The cabin recognizes you, you know, and, and less you so you got your hands full with bags or kids or whatever. You don't have to find a key. So all these little things to just make it frictionless for the traveler and to make it customized. Now we do that on Princess brand with that. On the other brands, we're trying other things. You know, we have you know, various suites of apps that we might use, et cetera. And we're seeing which ones you know, work better and which ones seem to, um, the guests seem to favor the most. Uh, so that's an example of the kinds of things we do, uh, but it's all around uh, having each individual guest feel like everything is about them, because it is. And so, so, and I saw your your keynote because I live in Las Vegas at CES ah. and, and was fascinated as as were most of the people in terms of the princess medallion. Um, yeah. As you think about this, is, we've been to the panel. One reason we were late was the panel before this, talking about talent. And I know this wasn't one of the questions I, we had That's been okay. talking about, but how is, are, are you having issues finding talent or are people still wanting to come and work in the cruise industry and see the world? And is yeah. that an, an issue you're having? So um, our crew is from 145 different countries. And so um, to tell you we have a challenge um, with talent would not be true. Um, you know, we, we can find now what we want is we want diversity and inclusion at all levels and all ranks and in our organization, because we think that's ultimately the best way to innovate and to provide, you know, the leading edge guest experience. Um, so that's always a challenge, you know, to, to have all levels, all ranks, all areas, all departments, um, to have the kind of diversity we, we strive to have. Uh, but in terms of finding talent, um, we, we don't have a, a, a big block there. And right now, the immediate challenge, of course, is medical staff. Right. So uh, we, we've had to add extra medical staff on every ship because we test on board, we test in the terminal. We, we have to screen. If there is someone with um, uh, detected with COVID, we have to isolate and we have to, uh, you know, we, we have contact tracing and stuff. So there's a lot of extra work. So we need some extra medical people. And of course, they're in high demand in general in society right now. So that would be an area where we are a bit challenged. Uh, shore side, a little bit of challenge in the IT area, um, but that was a challenge even before you know COVID. And then of course you have the great resignation going on globally. You know, COVID caused a lot of people to contemplate, to reflect on 
what they wanted to do with their lives and how they wanted to live their lives. And so you have a lot of job changing going on, period, in society. So we have some change, but we don't have the, the challenge of finding a talent. We just have to manage the, the, the flow and the flux. And then we had a massive change because we shut down. And mm -hmm. so now we've got to build back up. So, you know, we had 90,000 people at sea and normally we recruit 20 to 25,000 a year. Well, now we got to recruit a lot more than that, you know, to get the fleet, you know, going back. Uh, and so some of those will be people we're bringing back, a lot of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, people found other jobs and decided to change their lives and, you know, reordered their family priorities and so on. So, so those are the challenges, but the talent's out there. Okay, thank you for that. So, thank you. Uh, you know, Carnival Corporation wasn't the first company to cruise, obviously, and it is now has more brands and carries more passengers than any other cruise company in the world. What is it about Carnival's vision, both historically and today, that led to it being the largest cruise company in the world? You know, what happened was, um, Ted Arison, so Mickey's father, Mickey is our chairman, and he was chairman and CEO until he decided to split the role, and he and the board asked me to step off the board and take over as CEO. But, um, but Ted had a vision that uh, cruise could be for everyone. It could be accessible to everyone in society, you know, as opposed to it being only the elite and the super well-off, or in the case what people call cruise today, you know, for a while ships were really transit. They, they, they were passenger ships. And so you, you had the ultra luxury if you think back to the Titanic or whatever, if you, you know, the, the people who were, you know, really cruising and then a whole lot of people were just being transported. Um, and so he had a vision that people could cruise, could, could really have enjoy it. And that's what he founded, um, um, the first company he founded on. And uh, and then um, decided to go a separate ways from the, the people that backed him on that when he founded Carnival five years later. And, and that was the premise. So that was the start. The next move after that, after making it accessible to everyone, was um, thinking about it globally and saying, you know, let's have a portfolio of brands because the brands are very differentiated. Um, so they went on a portfolio hunt um, from ultra luxury down to what you would call mass appeal. Uh, and they also looked at geography. So brands that source globally versus brands that source nationally or regionally. So in our brand portfolio, you'll see we have Carnival, which is the namesake. It's a basically a U.S. brand. Um, the vast majority of guests are U.S. based. Um, it does have, you know, um, some international sourcing, but primarily U.S. based, uh, and the itineraries are basically, you know, home ports are primarily the U.S. We have a little bit of activity in Australia, and occasionally may home port, you know, out of a Caribbean location, but typically it's U.S. But then we, and then we also have P&O, um, which is one of is our British brand, and it's ninety six percent British, and sources, you know, Brits and sales out of um, all over the world and home ports different places but all for british uh, aida is our german brand cunard though is a global brand you know cunard has the queen mary too uh, it sources globally it's a british product but it but it sources globally and at home ports globally and and so it's a very different brand it's a, a very different experience seaborn ultra luxury um, sources globally etc so, so doing all of that created this portfolio, and that's how we became far and away the largest. At one point in uh, pre-COVID, we were about 45% of the global cruise industry. And, and I'm sure you know this, but for people who don't know this, you know, the term posh in English was always starboard out or poured out starboard home, and that was <laughs> how they assumed people uh -huh. were wealthy, correct? <laughs> And that's a, a useless fact that really doesn't mean anything. That, no, but um, that's where it came from. That's <laughs> so what, what does the cruise industry look like um, in the future in terms of customers' expectations? I think, look, 
uh, for a cruise, mainly people are looking to um, have lifelong memories. Uh, they're looking to have a good time. Uh, they're looking to explore and discover. Um, but the essence of our business is the human spirit. And what most people remember from cruising, you say you've cruised a lot, they remember the people experiences. It's either um, the guests to the crew, the guests with other guests, the guests to the locals and the destination they go to. And, and we are a human spirit people business. We have great cities at sea that we create in terms of our vessels, our Mardi Gras, our newest uh, Carnival brand ship has a roller coaster on top. I think it just made one of the top innovations in Popular Science magazine or something. Um, so we we have um, you know interesting features on ships and and all that to help engage people. But the idea is for people to connect either with their loved ones and the ones they want to travel with, and some of the smaller and and, and higher end brands, or in the case of a Carnival or a Costa. Our, our um, kind of European brand that's Italian based uh, is, is people want to socialize. They want to be the life of the party or around the life of the party. And so that's the essence of our business is, is creating uh, activity, venues, experiences for people to connect with other people. That's great. And I know we have a, a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask a couple of quick, quick questions if you have yeah. the time. Um, can you share with us how you've managed, um, you know, through this crisis, and how has it changed your management style? Well, I'm, I'm old, you know, so, um, so I've not been that old. A, <laughs> uh, I've, been, I've been around a little while, and so um, what I have to tell you is um, uh, the first thing was to be calm with a sense of urgency. So when crises like this happen. Um, you know, people react and, and they start flailing away. We've got to do stuff. We got, you know, and what you have to do is just, okay, let's, let's get it in order here. First things first. Number one, we got to get everybody home safe. How are we doing that? Yes, we've got a big cash burn. So we need some liquidity. How are we going to do that? Okay. We have to honor our highest priority, compliance, environmental protection, health, safety, and well-being for everyone. So how are we going to make sure we're honoring those things while we do these things? And so we put together a plan. And then you have to think of where people business. So I wanted my people to have a soft landing. We didn't know how long this was going to be. So we took maybe two to three months longer than a lot of companies to scale back and scale down on, on personnel because I wanted them to have a soft landing. And we could, even under the circumstances we were in, we could afford to do that without overly compromising the shareholders. And so, uh, you know, that was a big priority for us. And, and it's paying dividends because people are anxious to come back. They felt they got treated well, et cetera. Um, but, but the trick is to, to step back and remember the core thing. And the core thing is this too shall pass. So you just have to be able to weather the storm. You know, I, I don't want to get overly dramatic here, but World War I happened. World War II happened. You know, Vietnam War happened. All these things happened. Um, the Spanish flu happened. I mean, all these things happened. And, and they passed. And so what you have to do is figure out how are you going to survive because there's light at the end of the tunnel. You don't know how long that tunnel is, but you know there's light at the end of that tunnel. If you make it to that light, there's good times in there. So how do you do that in a way that, that keeps the business? Because we have a great business. Our business was, you know, on a, um, it, it, it was doing fantastic uh, uh, before COVID. And so we have a great business and a great, great offering. People love it. And uh, we have lots of potential. So, so that was it. And so you, 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 and then you listen and you communicate a lot. Communicate constantly. Um, I went from weekly leadership team meetings to daily, uh, twice a day leadership team meetings. Now we're down to two a week. Um, we'll probably maintain that because we found that's a good rhythm and, and it, it allows us to resolve things. We have all these different brands and we have to coordinate across them. Um, and um, similarly, communicating to everybody on the ships and, and everybody in the offices all over the world. You know, we're spread all over the place. And so uh, given that communication is a big one, listening to our travel agent professional partners, listening to our shareholders, listening, you know, to the investors, um, the banks and, you know, asset, you know, uh, backers and what have you. And so, you know, you got to listen, listen, listen and communicate, communicate, communicate. And then 
when you communicate, you can't be Pollyannish, but there's also no reason to be doom and gloom. You just need to be authentic, honest, and factual. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. This is what we're going to do about learning the things we need to learn on the things we don't know. And so those are some you know, basic principles and practices. I'm sure a lot of the people listening to this followed and in, in, in what they had to deal with as well. So can you tell us briefly, you know, with all the soliciting, what are the, some of the things you heard that you'd like to share? Yeah, along the way, um, I think um, one of the things I heard was a lot of confusion about the virus. So one of the things I did was, uh, we did, was I hosted, and I co-hosted it with WTTC, um, uh, uh, two summits on COVID. Had nothing to do with cruising. It was strictly on the science of COVID, what was fact, what was fiction, and what was still unknown. And, um, and I had um, assembled medical experts and scientists from around the world um, to do these virtual summits that we had. Uh, and these were, you know, renowned people. And one, we had, you know, some Nobel laureates. And, uh, but these, you know, we had some really uh, well-recognized people who really understood, you know, the science. And that was just to help get out to the world, you know, factual information about the virus. Because it influences regulatory, it influences people's attitudes and so on and so forth. And so that was one thing. Um, that listening, I realized, man, there's so much confusion on this. Anything we can do to add some clarity can only benefit us. And so we, we invested in recruiting because we had, you know, we have, have to have the medical experts advising us anyway. Um, and so we have put together a group, but we expanded well beyond that group um, and brought in some, some global experts. So that, that's an example. Okay, great. And um, just one more question. Um, Sure. Uh, obviously, your career has covered a wide variety of industries, from science, manufacturing, travel to entertainment. What's, See, so, what, is, yeah. what has helped yeah. you to be to succeed in so many different roles and different settings? What are some well, of the others lessons? Will have to tell you whether I, others will have to tell you whether I succeeded or not. <laughs> but um, what I learned um, very young in life was um, to listen. Um, I genuinely believe if you listen to the world, it will reveal itself to you. And so uh, rather than me coming in and saying, here's the solution, I, I go in with the questions and I listen. So every job I've been in, I, I listen, listen. Who do you listen to? You listen to your customers. You listen to your partners. You listen to your fellow employees. Yeah, when I was coming up, I especially listened to people who I thought had issues with me, you know, for whatever those issues were. I wouldn't understand what am I doing that's triggering this reaction in them. Because if I understand that, I'm now personally empowered to choose to deal with it or not to deal with it. But I, if I understand it, I, I, I'm empowered. And so, you know, those that seem to have issues with me or you know, I, I was getting negative reactions from, I, I spent the time, and, and they could tell I was genuinely interested. I wasn't trying to convince them of anything. I was just genuinely interested in, hey, tell me what, what am I doing that's creating this reaction in you? Um, and so if, if, you, if you can quiet yourself and just really earnestly listen, uh, the world will kind of tell you what to do. And so that's um, the, the best advice I could give anyone, and I'm doing a lot of talking today. But um, in, in another circumstance, I'd just be grilling you with questions, though, and, and listening to you. So that's, that's kind, of, kind of how I work. Well, this is great. And we really appreciate your, your time to, to spend with us today. And we will let you get back to your, which I'm sure is a very crazy day. Um, it is. But thank but you thank very much for your time. And we're sorry that we were late. Hey, no problem. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.